This is a Celestron Omni 150 6 inch F5 Newtonian reflector optical tube assembly, and today we're going to review it. You know, it wasn't that long ago when the 4.5 inch F8 Newtonian reflector was the most cloned telescope in our hobby. There were examples all the way up from Celestron to C4.5, all the way down to Tascos with cheap 0.965 inch focusers and cheap useless finders. But I think what's happened is lately, this 6 inch F5 optical tube has replaced the 4.5 inch F8 as the most cloned model that's out there. I mean, I had the Orion Star Blast, and now I have this one, and there have been so many different versions here, including, let's see, the Orion that I had, this Celestron, Apertura, GSO, Explorer Scientific, Bresser, Mead, Skywatcher, Photon, Altair, and at least two no-name generic models that I find on places like Amazon, eBay, and AliExpress. So, Looks like Aperture Creep has come up, a four and a half inch has become a six inch. This one is the Celestron version, and I have to tell you, this one is not bad. The Orion that I had, if you follow this channel, was one of the worst telescopes I've ever owned. The optics were awful, and it had a plastic inch and a quarter only focuser. This version here has a nice optical mirror attached to it, and a very fine two inch to inch and a quarter Crayford style focuser. Very nice. Now, the prices, again, are very reasonable. They, they sell a lot of these things, and this has become a internet budget favorite. At the time of filming, $399 for the optical tube, and around $700 to $750 coupled with the CG4 mount. That mount is pretty good. I don't have anything against the mount. I think my issue with it is that it's not quite strong enough to hold this 11 to 13 pound optical tube depending on what you have on it. The views are going to shake on you a little bit. If you have a CG5 or an AVX, you're going to be doing much better. And of course, the reason they put it on the CG4 is, you know, to keep the price down. So let's take a close-up look at this thing, and we'll also address this issue with the photo visual corrector. What does it do? How does it work? And most importantly, should you get one? Okay, so let's take a look at the optical tube here. Six inch F5 Newtonian reflector. Very well made, I think, for its price point. We have six collimation screws in the back, three in the front. We have a two inch, inch and a quarter hybrid Crayford style focuser. Again, I think that is very well made given its price point. As in many inexpensive Newtonians, the focuser draw tube does intrude into the light path when racked in. So if you want to put an inch and a quarter eyepiece in here, it goes in like this. If on the other hand you want to put a two inch eyepiece in here, and this adapter comes out, the two inch eyepiece goes in like this. It does come with an extension tube, should you have an eyepiece that takes a great deal of out-focus travel. This goes in here like this. And if you have an inch and a quarter, it comes in here like this. Well, that looks strange, doesn't it? Now, I found I never needed this extension tube, but there may be a case where you may need it at some point, so it's there should you need to use it. The dust cap here has one part of this that pops off. Many people ask, what is that doing there? Well, you could put the dust cap back on it and look through the telescope sub-aperture if you felt like doing that. A more common use of this is to put some solar film over this and use it as a solar telescope. And again, please be very careful. Do not look at the sun through your telescope unless you are absolutely sure you know what you're doing. Have a certified safe filter put on there before you try to do this. Okay, so the photo visual coma corrector. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, so this is, I think, one of the most misunderstood and misapplied pieces of equipment that come my way in a long time. So this one says Apertura on it, but this same product is available under many different nameplates, including GSO, Orion, and I'm sure other names as well, depending on what part of the world you happen to be living in. So the problem with this is every one of these I've seen, except perhaps the Orion, does not come with any instructions at all. It's just, you know, I guess you're just supposed to know what to do. So in visual mode, it's not that bad. There's a lens down here, and there's a two-inch collar at the top. So you could just do this, and what this does is it cleans up the edges 
on the field of view in any fast Newtonian, of which this is one. This device cost me $129. The price varies a little bit depending on which version you buy. Okay, so the problem is, what if you want to use this thing in imaging mode, if you want to take images through it? Well, again, there's no instructions, and I think the most common instinctive thing to do is to just put a two-inch nose piece on your camera like this. Okay, you can get these lots of different places. You put the coma corrector in here like this, and then you stick your camera in here and off you go. That is actually incorrect. As I discovered myself, the images do not look very good when you do that. This is actually wrong. So this is my modded T3i, so let's take this and get this out of the way. That's not how you do it. Let's get this out of the way. Let's get this out of the way. What you're supposed to do, and this isn't even obvious until you've run into somebody who's actually done this, the lower part of this screws off. Okay, and this part is just the spacer. There's no optics in here at all. The optics are all in the lower part. There's a ring here, and many people ask, what does that ring do? Well, it slips onto here, and the other end of this is a standard M42 thread, and it goes on like this. And this is what goes on the camera, and this is how it goes in. But wait, <laughs> there's more. Look carefully on the website and they'll tell you that this spacing here is actually incorrect. You need an additional 20 millimeter spacer, which I don't even have here. Most of the outlets that I find that sell these, at least at the, uh, at least at the time of filming, do not sell the 20 millimeter spacer. So, I, I mean, are the images better with the spacer in place? They probably are. This back spacing is usually pretty critical when it comes to the, you know, the flange distance between the lens here and the back of your sensor. But you know what? It's a cheap scope. I just went ahead and ran with this anyway. The images were much better than with this spacer here. So there is an excellent thread on cloudy nights from someone who did figure all this stuff out. I will link that below. This guy went through a lot of trouble and it's an excellent read and I do recommend it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put this back together again so you can see the process in reverse. There's the T-ring. There's the adapter that goes to the T-ring. And this screws together like this. And we're back to normal. So the question is, is this thing worth the money? Should you spend the $129 US or so to get one of these? I'm going to say yes, because I think you're probably going to wind up getting this anyway, even if you don't take any images at all. It does help clean up the edges of the field of view, and again, I think it's probably worth it. Do you need to get it right away? Maybe not, but I think most people who buy this telescope eventually are going to wind up wanting to get this. Okay, so some of the versions that you'll get of these optical tubes will come with mounts. These include the Celestron, the Skywatcher, and I believe the Bresser, and there may be others as well, but some of you may just wind up getting the optical tube. And one of the biggest challenges here, of course, is finding a mount to put it on. Experience shows that beginners tend to undermount their telescopes. A photographic tripod is not going to cut it. You are going to need a telescope astronomy-specific mount. We could use something like this. It's a Altaz manual only mount like this Vixen Porta. For some reason, these things have fallen out of fashion lately. I don't really know why. This is okay. I don't think it's super steady. Things are gonna be jiggling and shaking on you a little bit. You can't see that on camera, but through the eyepiece, that becomes a little more obvious. So the more common thing that you see doing uh, happening these days is to put it on a tracking equatorial mount like this. CG5. Now, if you get the version from Celestron, you are going to get it on a CG4 mount. Those are okay, I guess. But again, uh, with the CG4, this 11 to 14 pound optical tube weight is going to start to stress that mount. If you have a CG5 or an ABX, that's the next size up that I have here. It's also known as the LX85 from Mead. It's known as many other names as well around the world. This is a lot more steady and you get this, uh, this is a little bit incorrect here. Let's balance this. There we go, that's about what you need to do. And this actually works quite well and you have the benefit of full go-to capability. 
And again, if you're new to this, a six inch telescope is fine. It seems as though the industry has moved towards an eight inch and I've crept up there myself. An eight inch daub is what I normally use, but you know, for several nights here, and I tried to use just this as my only observing telescope. And you know what? It was fine. I didn't really feel the need to upgrade to anything else. When I was growing up, the six inch was the standard beginner's telescope. And again, if you're new at this, six inch telescope is more than enough to see craters on the moon, the rings of Saturn, belts on Jupiter, as well as its four moons, and Shopi's objects like the Andromeda Galaxy, the Pleiades, the Orion Nebula, and under dark enough conditions, hundreds of deep sky objects. These days, with light pollution encroaching on all of our lives, the limiting factor is likely to be your observing location and not necessarily the aperture of your telescope itself. Okay, so what about imaging? Well, like one of those other internet budget favorites, the Astrotech AT72, these six inch F5 optical tubes have become a popular gateway drug into astrophotography. I'll give you the standard disclaimer that astrophotography is quite difficult and very few people succeed at it. But if you wanna give it a try, this is here for you. So there are many different ways you can do astrophotography and for lunar and planetary work, I have one of these uh, ZWO uh, astronomy specific webcams. This is the one I use. There are many other models out there. If you want to try that, you can do something like this. This is an image of the moon that I took. That is a stitch of three or four individual images that I melted together. As for deep sky imaging, so things get a little bit more complicated. I just want to stress, I don't think this is a very good astrophotography telescope. It's okay at best, but that's all right because I view this thing more as a learning tool than as a serious astrophotography instrument. You can learn the ropes on this thing and decide if you want to upgrade yourself later on. I also want to stress that the, your expense does not stop at the telescope and the mount. My camera, for example, has been modified for use for astrophotography. The modification voids the warranty and renders the camera useless for conventional photography. So if you want another camera to take pictures of your kids or your cat, whatever, you've got to buy another camera. But I did try astrophotography on deep sky with this thing over several months, not necessarily because I think it's a good scope, which I said I don't think it is, but because I just was just curious to see what it would do. What I found is on brighter objects, it was fine. For example, here is the Andromeda galaxy. That doesn't look too bad. And even on a smaller object like NGC 891, that doesn't look too bad either. Here is the veil. Here is the dumbbell, the crescent, and the Pac-Man. And again, those don't look too bad, but what I find with some of these inexpensive Newtonians is as you get towards these lower contrast objects, things start to get a little bit worse. For example, here is M33. That doesn't look very good. And for comparison, I had my astrophysics stowaway refractor sitting right next to it, taking another image at exactly the same time, and I was able to get this. And that is hardly a serious attempt. I was just goofing off just to make this comparison. As you go dimmer again, here is IC443. That is the jellyfish nebula in Gemini. And here is the infamous horse head. You can almost feel the telescope struggling to capture the photons there. But again, on brighter objects like the Orion Nebula, this doesn't look too bad. So again, regarding the cost, it's not just the optical tube in the mount and the camera, which has been modified. There is an auto guider. There is a laptop to run the auto guider. And then there is the processing software. Pix Insight is what I use. That is a couple of hundred euros at the time of filming. So even though the optical tube only cost $399 US, I had to surround this thing with almost $3,000 worth of gear just to take some of those images. Okay, so are there any drawbacks? Not really. I think at this price, we can't complain whether you buy the optical tube or whether you get it with the mount. Again, my biggest concern is beginners are going to put this on a mount that's a little bit too light. Once you get that problem solved, I think this is fine. You can learn on it, and this will keep you busy for a long time. It could also introduce you to astrophotography. One question I sometimes get, which version of these should I get? Like, which brand should I get? Should I get the Celestron, the Skywatcher, the Orion, whatever? 
I'll tell you, I haven't seen a lot of difference between these. They are consistent in their inconsistency. I'll see a good one, then I'll see one that's maybe not so good. The only one I might steer you away from is, say, the Orion, because it has that inch and a quarter plastic focusers. The others, you know, I would say get the one that's offering the best deal, get the one that has the most options on it, get the one that you can find in stock. So on this one, the Celestron has their Starbright XLT coatings. I would say that that's something in favor of this particular version. But on the other hand, I have had people tell me that there are other versions that have their own enhanced coatings on them, and they put them on there anyway, and they just don't tell you. So that might be an equal thing from all of the models. I don't know. Anyway, I find this thing easy to use, it's pleasant, it's cheap, and I'm going to say it's highly recommended in all forms. You know, someone once told me the best possible ending to any review is for the reviewer to say, I bought the review sample. So I lost the Orion Star Blast. I just wasn't using it. I sold it. This one used to belong to a club member, and uh, yeah, I bought the review sample. Okay, all right, go ahead. You, you can make fun of me now. Just, okay, just make fun of me. It's all right. It's all right.